Hello and welcome to today's edition of Gibson's Caring Corner. And I want to say uh, Happy Easter, everyone. Easter is the time you know, to remembering Christ and His resurrection and everything He has done for us. Um, it's also a time where people usually go out and they get new outfits for Easter. There's lots of Easter egg hunts for the little ones to go on. And yeah, it brings you into time of being with family. And with that being said, you know, today's edition is on relationships and dating whenever you're a senior. And I think Creighton has some information for us. Yeah, so this is an interesting one. Um, Tracy can kind of relate to this from years past with her mother. But as we grow older, uh, personal relationships may take on a new meaning and importance as individuals move away from careers, part-time work, and retirement. So dating in particular can be a source of confusion, potential friction for the families. So how do you tell your family you're seeing someone? How do you ask a parent about the nature of his or her relationship? Uh, we're going to cover a lot of this this morning. So uh, we're going to help you define and develop relationships that are important to you and deal with potential pitfalls along the way. And I think it's important that you have a conversation with your mom or dad about what that would look like. I know jokingly, one time whenever I went and signed up um, someone for service, I, you know, I love to ask what is still on their bucket list. If they could do something else that their children um, could help them achieve, what would it be? And um, there was a, a lady, um, she was from Mooresville, and I was with her and her daughter in her home, and she grinned. She was probably 83, 84. She grinned really big, and she said, I think I'd like to get married one more time. And I thought that her daughter was going to fall out of the chair, mm -hmm. and it was a good chuckle for all of us. But the conversation is important to have. Yeah. So just a state of affairs and some of the research that we found most parents and adult children draw a line when it comes to romantic relationship conversations. Only 28% of adult children surveyed would be comfortable talking with the parent about sex if the parent becomes single, and approximately 39% would be comfortable talking about dating. Yeah, I can remember, Creighton, whenever, you know, after your mother passed away, and your dad, you know, he had helped her while she was sick for a very long time. Um, and he started dating. Mm -hmm. tell, tell everybody how that made us feel. He did. That, that was, mom and dad were married 38 years. And, and all I'd ever seen was him and her together. And after she passed away, it was, um, it was interesting to walk in the house and, and find somebody else there. Yeah, it can um, be unsettling, especially yeah, if it, you're not it mentally was, made me uneasy. <laughs> prepared for it. So it's important to have those conversations very much. Uh, when my mother uh, married uh, for the last time, and again, this is just you know, us telling you how it made us feel, yeah. um, and mother may marry again, not saying that she wouldn't, but um, when she married the third time, um, she ran off and got married. And neither his children knew nor her, ch her child um, knew. So it was a total shock um, whenever they came back. But, you know, they are, they've done it before. <laughs> they've got married before. Yeah. They have every right to go get married. But as a child, it's just like, Wow. Um, we we yeah. knew both of them were dating, and we didn't know they were going to run off to South Carolina and, and get, married. get married. Yes. Um, so, that was um, a shock. So after, after we all got over it, honestly, we have the best time together at all the holidays. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, they are top-notch as far as um, my um, stepbrothers and stepsisters, and we love meeting with them um, on every holiday. Yeah. All the right. only family i got now besides you and Brittany. That's it. So we're going to talk about ACT, Assess, Consider, and Talk. And this will help you kind of 
walk through the process of talking with mom or dad. So the assess, uh, how important will relationships be to you as you grow older? What kind of support network do you envision as you age? And you know, to go into a little bit more detail there, yeah, open into questions. Yeah, have them describe um, what their circle of family and friends would look like, um, and yeah, you know, how they would want to interact. You know, if you have someone that is never really gotten out and never been to the senior center and not you know been interactive in that manner, they're not going to want to do that after their spouse or loved one passes away. So. Um, you have to you have to understand and not force what you think is good for everybody if it may not be good for your loved one. Every each person is individually made by God and has different likes and desires. So another one is to identify who you would go to for help with tasks that you could no longer accomplish. Yeah, if you were to ask um, your mother or father, you know, Tell me one thing that you would like to have help with. If they feel guilty that they're going to bother you, they're not going to ask you. And so just know that. Um, we have signed up so many clients, and they're like, I, I just I don't want to bother my children. Yeah. They're trying to live their lives. Um, but there could be something that you're willing to do, even if it is just you know cleaning the house or doing two loads of laundry a week, just something, maybe doing their grocery shopping that could help them have a successful life at home. And the, those minutes that you're able to give them of your time is so valuable. And then if if you wanted to hire an agency to come do those tasks, but you be there and you be that daughter or son while the agency is doing those tasks, that can be some excellent time that you can spend with your loved one. Yeah. So... The other question, are romantic relationships important to you as you grow older? Why or why not? Some, maybe yes. Others, maybe maybe no. Uh, well, you know, your you know, mom, my, after the third time, after, says yeah, no. Yeah, mom, I said, mom, if you know, up to you. And she's like, no, I am not getting married again. I'm mm -hmm. like, good enough. So that is totally up to you. Um, I, I will say that. All, all three of her husbands have passed away, um, all due to different circumstances. But um, anyway, mom, mom has said, nope, that's enough. And so I, I would support her in any way. All right, so we're to the C's now to consider. So consider what your life would be like if you were suddenly single. Where would you turn and to whom? Yeah, I'm going to say, you know, you can be lonely, if you are single, yeah. if if you always had someone in your home that you were sharing your home with, and then all of a sudden there's no one, yeah, a, a pet can do so much, but the interaction with humans, with people, is important whether you realize it or not. Yeah. And so, if you have a mother or father that is by themselves, they need that interaction, even if it's a phone call, and a phone call a day. Wouldn't that be great? Um, because you do need those touch points in life, and that helps you mentally be able to keep on going and know that mom and dad is okay because they are having those conversations with you, and they will tell you, maybe not in a sudden way, but you could sense if they need something whenever you're having those conversations. Yeah, you know, when, when mom died and dad was the most calm easygoing personality you'd ever meet, never complained about anything. But you could tell, you know, he was lonely. Um, he would get out and and go to breakfast with all the men at the restaurants and stuff. But it's still him and mom are soulmates, kind of like me and you. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, he missed her when she was gone. Sure. And my mother, uh, she will go to a Bible study on Fridays. And but she does dog sit two dogs a day. Um, yeah, she could use a little more interaction with people, um, and she gets so excited whenever we come home um, after work, and she is ready to just talk and have a good time with us. And usually we are about wore out, and it's hard for us to say hardly anything. So 
And whenever it comes to a time where you're still having to work and mom and dad need that interaction, what are some things that you could do? Yeah, is it another retired family member that could possibly pop in um, a couple of times a month and just um, just to touch base and see how things are going? Mm-hmm. What else could you do? Is it an agency that you would bring in to help ha- help Possibly. help take them to their favorite places and things? It might be the Amish store to get fried apple pies. Mm-hmm. It might be a movie. It may be something at the senior center or something going on in your community. We have Fort Dobbs in our community, and they do a lot of fun, interacting things um, from years ago, and they even have some things coming up. So there, in your community, there would be a visit your community um, page, and there will always be things that you can do, but you do have to look ahead and plan. I think this week there's a movie out called Journey that's a Christian movie mm-hmm. that is playing today, tomorrow, and Wednesday that would be a good activity to, to take, take family out to and see. Yep. So the last of the ACT is talk. Uh, communication is the key to bridging any personal gap with others, and reaching out to others can help articulate your needs. So after assessing and considering you want to just write down how you will stay socially connected and maintain strong relationships and then talk with a family member or friend about how you'll make that happen. And then once you write it down, make sure your loved one reads it. And you know, sometimes they have hearing problems. You're not quite sure what they're agreeing to. So make sure you write it down, review it. And, you know, I recently watched a video where um, – a mother had her 14-year-old sign a document mm. about the things if something happened to her, um, what they would, what she would want to happen. Yeah. And so, wow, wouldn't that be great if you already had things as simple as this? Because this is beyond estates and wills and stuff like that. This, this is just life in general. Um, and you know, this would be something that you could put as a keepsake. Um, and also know that if it came to pass, what what they would want support him. That's all I have today. Well, very good. Well, I do hope you've enjoyed today's edition of Gibson's Caring Corner. Hi, welcome back to Health Tips with Kale, your exercise science, health, and fitness enthusiast. So today we'll be finishing up our carbohydrate series, and we're going to do a bit of a summary and application for what we've covered over the last six or seven episodes for the series. So we know that carbohydrates can be broken down to simple sugars, starches, and fiber. We know that carbohydrates are there to provide energy, to help keep energy stored within the system along with keeping water um, within our system. It helps to uh, mitigate how much fat and protein that we burn for uh, creating energy. So in a way, it can actually help keep protein and muscles um, and also help keep fat when we need fat, but also help to burn fat when we need to burn fat. We also know that carbohydrates are broken down into glucose, and glucose is pretty much what the body uses for energy, but glucose can also be there to help build other molecules, such as the sugars found in our DNAs. So... We know that we need to have anywhere from 45 to 65% of our total daily, daily calorie um, ex- intake from carbohydrates. With, with that being said, though, only about 45% is probably what most of us need, especially if we're living a sedentary lifestyle. I would say 65% if we have a bit more of an active lifestyle or if we're working a very physical job, but for most of us that are sitting down most of the day, or when we go home and we just sit down in front of the TV, we're not really doing much. We're not going to the gym. We're not going for walks. We're not doing much of anything. We just, we go to work, we sit in a cubicle and we go home and all we want to do is watch TV just to relax. We really shouldn't be eating 65% of our diet in carbohydrates because we don't really need all that excess energy. So, With that being said, for simple sugars, we need less than 10% of all of our daily calorie intake 
to be less than 10% if that. It's better to actually put that closer towards 0% if possible. So simple sugars are found in things naturally, such as your milks, your fruits, um, but it can also be artificial and added to other foods such as our ice creams, our sodas, our fruit juices sometimes. There's a lot of things that have a lot of added simple sugars, but the thing with simple sugars though is that it adds or it spikes our blood glucose levels, which causes a variety of many issues for us. It, with that, it can also lead to having a sugar crash, is what most of us know it as, later in the day, leaving us feeling exhausted, drained, uh, just mentally fatigued or very groggy. Um, excess simple sugars or excess carbohydrates leads to excess fat. Um, it leads to high blood pressure. And it can also lead to things such as heart disease, diabetes, and or a stroke. We uh, also know from the last episode that it's better to eat our, uh, simple sugars or uh, starches or carbohydrates in general um, within four or not within four hours of bedtime. It's better to actually eat simple sugars within a three hour period um, during or after exercise. And that being said, the starches are the same way. We really shouldn't be eating starches as soon as we wake up. We shouldn't be eating starches and simple sugars right before bed. It's better to eat all those things together. It's better to eat them uh, within that three hour window during and after exercise. But with that being said, our starches are probably what are going to make up the rest of our carbohydrate intake. So if we're eating 45 to 65%, depending on our activity level, and 10% of that comes from simple sugars, that means the rest, though, 35 to 55%, or 175 to 275 grams a day, are coming from starches. And so starches are found in a lot of things. They're found in like potatoes, they're found in most vegetables, fruits. And so with that, starches are actually a better source than simple sugars because it takes the body a little bit longer to break down. So if we remember back to the first episode, starches are sort of like simple sugars just combined. So if we look at like say a sugar cube, if a sugar cube represents a simple sugar, then a starch is just multiple simple sugars or multiple sugar cubes all added together. And so our bodies need to take the time and the energy to actually break that down. And because of that, it tends to provide a little bit more energy throughout the day. We don't get as high of a blood sugar uh, rise and then crash, though it can still lead to that. As I said, Starches are often found in vegetables and potatoes, broccoli, beans, and grains. Eating excess can lead to the same health issues as eating too many simple sugars. Um, so if you eat too many starches, then it can lead to things such as, once again, high blood, bl high blood sugar levels, high blood pressure, it can lead to diabetes, stroke, all those sort of things. And if we're not eating enough, well, if not eating enough, then we're also leading to dehydration. We can have not enough energy throughout the day. Um, we could rely more on our proteins and fats to, to get our energy, and that can lead to a lot of other issues too. And so lastly, fibers. So if we can't eat starches or simple sugars right before bed or right as we wake up, and we can only eat them within a certain amount of time frame, depending on when we work out. Or if we're not working out, then eating starches and simple sugars mostly in the morning, because that's when most people are active. Then when are we supposed to eat our carbohydrates? Well, we're supposed to eat 25 to 30 grams of fiber a day. So anything that contains high fiber, such as your fruits, your vegetables, those are things that we can eat throughout the day. It's better to eat a, a meal high in fiber than it is to um, just eat a bunch of fruit or not just fruit, but uh, ice cream, for instance, or cake early in the morning. So 
maybe eating fruit instead, but not eating a whole lot of fruit in the morning. Fiber is there to help kind of slow the digestive process down. It helps to clean out our intestinal tract a little bit too. But more than that, it kind of really just helps to make sure our bodies don't get those high blood sugar level spikes throughout the day. So it's really there to kind of help slow things down for us and not put too much of a stress on our bodies. And fibers can be found in things like nuts, fruits, vegetables, uh, and other most starchy foods. But trying not to eat too much before bed and not too much before in the morning because once again, they're tied to starchy foods. So maybe eating a bigger meal for lunchtime when we're eating these high fibrous or starchy foods. So something that we could do for like breakfast in the morning is maybe eating an avocado with eggs and then maybe a piece of fruit or two in the morning. That would be a good way to not eat too much in the morning. Um, we could have things like nuts or other pieces of fruit for a snack in the morning. Um, and lunch, as I said, it's just lunch, trying to make that your bigger meal as far as carbohydrates go. And then dinner, maybe having like a salad or a side of vegetables with uh, chicken or some other source of protein. Those would be the best by far. So simple sugars need to be less than 10% a day. And that comes to, see, less than 50 grams. So if you think about it, a soda, that's normally around that 40 gram mark. So having one soda kind of equates the whole day's worth of simple sugars right there. The, your starches, which make up the remainder, that's 175 to 275 grams a day, or the 35 to 55%. So just make the right choices. Eat more vegetables, eat more fruits, eat more nuts, and you'll do just fine. And thank you again for joining us with Health Tips with Kale. Welcome back. Let's go back through time. The stories of Elizabeth Ann Reinhardt Gibson in Mooresville, North Carolina. And I do want to say thank you to Kale for all of his information on carbohydrates in that series. I do hope you enjoyed that. Now, back to our story. We went to Coates to get a fresh drink of water. I had only grown big enough to draw water, and I wanted to show all my family how I could draw a bucket of water. As I was drawing the bucket up, I lost my grip and let the windlass go. We always have been warned never to let the water bucket hit the bottom of the well or we would knock the bottom of the bucket out if it hit hard. So I grabbed the rope as it was flying down the well. The rope burned my hands all to smithereens. I was bleeding and crying. Dad said, why didn't you let it go? I said that I was afraid it would burst the bottom out. He looked at my burned hands and told me to go home and let my mom put salve on it so I didn't have to work in the cotton patch for a few days. Now that part was good. Often we would come in at lunchtime to eat dinner and beg mother to go with us to the creek to swim, the, swim in the old sand hole. One afternoon she said, go to the shed with us. It was located at Highway 150 and too much traffic for us to go by ourselves. I ran ahead of all the others and I dove into the sand hole when all around four big water moccasins dropped out of the tree over my head. I have never been so frightened ever. I got out of that creek and had never been in it since. Dad hauled sand out of the creek with a sand drag pan drawn by horses so he could sell the sand to the contractors around our area. And this was around you know, Lake Norman. This is the 500 miles of shoreline. He had an old 1927 Chevrolet dump truck. He hauled two yards of sand per truckload. It cost the brick contractors $2 per load. Most brick veneer homes had used Dad's sand for making mortar. The 1927 Chevy truck had wooden spokes and small tires, no doors, a wooden steering wheel. When I rode with him, I was frightened beyond words. He held onto that steering wheel with both hands. Once he and Bill were taking a load of sand to Mooresville when they stopped at a stop sign on McLand and Broad Streets when Dad asked Bill if anything was coming from his direction. Bill said, 
No. Dad said, well, nothing's coming my way. He eased off the clutch and the brake and stepped on the accelerator to find, hey! Neither looked straight in front of them. They hit a heavy black lady crossing the street. She wasn't injured, got up, and went on her way. Dad, Dad never drove again. <laughs> Homemade chewing tobacco was another product grown and made on the Reinhardt farm. We grew our own tobacco, pulled, cured, and stored it time to time to make plugs of tobacco for chewing. The tobacco, the tobacco was straightened and packed in large wooden boxes. On a rainy, humid day, they went to the old house beside the corn granary where they got out the press, molasses, and saccharin and drizzled the leaves to as thick and as large as a plug of tobacco could be. The leaves then were put into a wood press and left to season and form the plug. They wrapped the plugs in cloth and stored it until ready for use. There was a gray, tallow-looking wax that absolutely smelled worse than anything you could imagine. And I'm going to try to pronounce this. Acidifity is what is, is showing here in the words. Does cow manure smell? Well, it smells good compared to this daggone stuff. Well, our family believed in warding off disease before it came to you. <laughs> Our mother would make a large marble of this stuff, thread it into a string, and then she made us wear it around our necks to ward off disease. You're right. How can one catch anything if there's no one near enough to you for a germ to get on you? <laughs> so finally, after being an outcast at school, I figured it out. Hey, no one can stand this stuff, so I walked by the mailbox. I would toss my string in the back of the box until evening. When I was on my way home, I put it back around my neck. Don't you know that poor mailman, Mr. Howell, thought something sure did smell badly every time he opened that mailbox. So that's going to end today's stories in Mooresville, North Carolina with um, Elizabeth Ann Reinhardt Gibson. And I do hope and wish each and every one of you a wonderful Easter. Thank you for watching Karen Corner. Make sure you head over to our Facebook and YouTube channel where you will find this program along with others. Be sure that you subscribe, like, and click the notification bell so that you will receive notifications for our weekly program. Don't forget to share this program to your social media platforms. If there's a question that you would like to ask, make sure to email it to caringcorner22 at gmail.com. We hope to see you on the next episode of Caring Corner.